TETH in Sweden and in Kalfu University Finland. I'm stationed in Finland right now. Um, my current role is, is that I'm developing for the, uh, the business side of functional safety at the firm. Uh, I'll talk about the firm in a bit. But um, So what is functional safety? We'll go through that in a bit. It is a bit more of a topic of what we call industrial engineering. We got into that topic in a while, so that's why I thought it would be easier to uh, join from the industrial side and then coming from the AI side and see what are the similarities, how is the industry responding to that, and how each of you can contribute towards that. A little about my firm. So I'm currently working for this firm called Hulg. Uh, it comes from the name Humane and Bold, they just merged it together. But what we essentially do is we serve different sectors in the EU, uh, starting from railways, autonomous vehicles, electric charging, all the way to space solutions. So we work with European Space Agency, we do some space solutions there. And here are basically a couple of offerings which we have. So we work in safety and security, that's my department. Uh, embedded solutions, product design and development, and of course, digital software. Uh, so you can see I work in a firm where all of these people sit together from different areas of life, from different engineering backgrounds, and then we discuss these topics that, hey, how will AI affect this, how will AI affect that, and how will everything go in that direction. Let me start by asking a question. So we know that different countries in the geopolitical powers, they serve a certain purpose. So we know that, for example, Ukraine, it was really important for grain. We didn't knew that, but when this war started, then we found out that, okay, a huge portion of the world was dependent on Ukrainian grain. From Pakistan, we have our exports, we have our cotton, we have other agriculture exports from there. From the US, we have security. From China, we have manufacturing. From Japan, we have other innovations. But question is, what does Europe bring to the world? So Europe as a continent, as an entity, what do they serve to the world? Well, why are they important? What is their export? All are correct, good. But there's one thing that they really make money out of and that's standardization. The industrial revolution, when we talk about it, it always started from either Spain, from France, from Germany, from the UK. That whole continent started that revolution. It spread all over the world, and now everyone looks into to them to do these standardizations. Our industrial, our machinery standards, Pakistan machinery standards are derived from those. Chinese standards are derived from those. The US standards are derived from those. That's where the powerhouse is when it comes to Europe. Simplest example I can give right now, uh, everyone heard that the iPhone or Apple had this huge controversy where they had to change their ports in their laptops and their phones. Why? Because Europe said so. It's a US company, but Europe forced them to change it. Same with us, if Europe comes up with a legislation that hey, certain chemicals should be banned, they're going to be banned here in Pakistan as well. That's what they bring to the world. That's their export, in a way. So coming from a European continent, there everyone talks about industry, industry. Like here, we mostly talk about agriculture and the revolution in agriculture. Our government policies are based on agriculture. In Finland, in Europe, they're mostly based on industry. So for me, it's really important that I keep up with the trends of what's happening in the industry right now. So, coming back to the topic, uh, I think the previous slide said about something about safety and security, but let me build up to that topic. So what are we seeing right now in terms of how the industry or we as a society are, well, the society in terms of technology are evolving? Well, we had these laptops, we had these switches, on-off light switches, then we had circuit breakers, then we had other equipment, then we had automated, let's say, lighting. All of this was coming in, into our institute. But what's changing now? Now, what's happening is that everyone wants them to be connected. You want, for example, these lights to be turned off, from a, not only from a control system, you want to be sitting on press a button, the light should be turned off, the factory should be turned off, uh, the camera should be turned off, everything automated. Everyone's asking for that. So imagine there's this 
really old, let's say, milling machine or a loom somewhere, sitting somewhere, and then suddenly it needs to be upgraded. There's a demand in that. Then let's talk about the consumer side. You, us, what are we demanding from, let's say, all the industries, all the manufacturing, what are we asking for them? We're asking for more control. We're asking for more features. We're asking for more AI in a way. We're asking for more automation. You don't want to be bothered with, for example, writing some contracts and stuff. You just want to pay the bill and get your cell service online. You just want to be able to pay the bill and the electricity comes. You just want things to be simpler. You just want that, hey, okay, when I come home, there's this automated vacuum cleaner just, you know, sweeps the floor even before I come in. If, if we, before I go to home, the electricity should be turned on, the heating should be turned on. I come from Finland, it's like minus 20 over there. And it's important that when I leave the office, my home is already warm by the time I get there. But it saves electricity, it just figures out that I'm going home, it turns it on. Same is going with How do we deal with this? So that is the real buzz here. That's where I believe it's coming into that whole uproar against AI. That's the argument here. Okay. Now that we know what a vulnerability is, what a threat is, how does a cyber problem with the cyber can cause a safety issue, let's just talk about AI now more deeply. And again, I would like to, now I'm not going to be much technical, I'm going to talk more in terms of stories, we're going to talk more in terms of my projects or how I'm dealing with this. So the project I'm working on now is what we call visual navigation. The idea is that we have a drone, Usually the industry standard in drones are that you have basically the drone and then you have a GPS receiver on it and it's constantly in contact with where it is right now. It needs to be aware. That's basically a law that the drone needs to be aware where it is. So in case it goes into a dormant facility, it automatically boxes, blocks the drone from going into. So for example, you have a controller and you want to fly over, let's say, I don't know, the presidential palace or the residence or something like that. You'll try to push it forward, it won't go through. This is what we call a geofencing. And that's built into the drone. That's what, we, that's what I'm talking about from Europe. Those are the legislation that are coming in. That's the laws that are coming in. And they're introducing these laws. And now every drone in the world, China is like there's a whole uproar about it. That's why do we have to do this. But they eventually have to do this. It's a security feature. It's a safety feature. So what we're doing here, we have flying over to Roman Washington University, it sees it, it recognizes it, and then it suddenly knows where it is without a GPS. Because it has maps, all the world map, the Google Maps or anything, stored in its system on its own. Whereas the AI, the AI is recognizing where it is right now and fitting itself on the huge jigsaw puzzle. In the next slide, please look at better. Yeah. So you have the drone view, and then you have the stored maps on board, it just recognizes where it is, puts it on top, that's it. What I want to discuss here, or want to, if I come a little bit more technical here, would be how we did this. We had the maps, we had a drone, we flew it, we got some video feed, we got some video data. We, what, the point here was that we needed a lot of data to do this. We needed the data of the whole world. We needed to fly different locations. We needed to fly in different environmental conditions. There was snow sometimes, there was sometimes foggy, it was a bit rainy, and every time the face of the earth changes. And that's, that was like the beautiful part of this project, that we learned how much the earth changes during the season. The whole thing that came in, we trained it, we put it on the drone, now it's working. I have a small demo if it plays, yes. So as you can see here, it's flying right now, it has no idea where it is, and suddenly you can see the dot starts moving. That's when it recognizes that, okay, hey, I'm here, okay, I'm just going to start following. See, it takes the image, it takes in the background from the original Google Maps, finds itself, and then starts moving to this. So this is what we call a visual navigation or image matching or feature matching, whatever you want to call it. Now. Detect the location, take an image and find where we are in the world. It's a tool. We're using it that way. There are some degrees or some law that it needs to follow. Okay, it needs a certain amount of accuracy. It will be useless if it can't find itself anywhere in the world. There's a certain amount of accuracy. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate. As you saw in the last video, 
drone was a bit shaky, although my drone was like flying really straight. But that's fine. That's I don't need that much effort. It's fine. Some error is okay. Uh, we expect it not to hurt anyone. If there is an AI, so for example, there's a firmware set system, it shouldn't hurt anyone. That's a certain thing. And then finally, it shouldn't leak anyone's data. That's what we expect from a tool, from an AI, to effectively work in our homes, effectively work in the industries as well. So we have these, let's say, requirements, and we put them here. Let's make an AI then. So here's the process we use at Pooled to develop, let's say, any AI model. First is we need to understand the opportunity, or let's call them the requirements, and the requirements we listed in the last page. Then we develop some KPIs. Okay, what are the key performance indicators? A drone is flying, how much degree of accuracy is acceptable? Five meters, 10 meters, we define that. Then obtaining the data. So about the drone project, we did flights for six months, three times a day, two different altitudes. We did those flights consistently uh, for six months because, okay, it was Finland, it started in June, so it was summers. Uh, it was a bit sunny, green leaves, all that, then autumn came, then leaves turned yellow, and then winter came, and then everything was snowy. We had that much data. In between, there was fall, rain one or two times. We had all this data there. Do you obtain that network matters? Then let's jump to the case study. So, Based on the process I showed you, we created a chatbot in the lab. Uh, it had a well balanced data. Let's assume we gathered enough data that was well partitioned, well balanced. All naturally, we didn't even synthetically create it. We just balanced it. So we made it. It worked in the lab. We're talking to it. It gives you answers. You ask it a question. It gives you answers. It can analyze the data or anything. And then we gave it access to the internet so that it can have more access to a bigger, let's say, network of data. I can pull in data from there, pull in some search results, give you a solution, summarize some research papers, move it on from there. But then the problem. Problem came that the AI was a bit biased towards people of color. When we asked that, okay, given these five pictures, who would have committed this X crime? It was a bit biased. The internet. It just used that systematic racism that was happening in the US or the UK or even in, let's say, Europe that happened over the years. I'm not sure how much it got better or not right now, but in the past we all know it was a thing. And there was data according to that. The arrest numbers were more for people of color, although they, com they didn't even commit that crime. There was that information available. It got access to it. It did what its job. It basically answer the question, analyze the data, give you a solution. The point here is that was your original KPI. If we go back a bit, we expect results with some degree of accuracy and it's not hurting anyone and it's not leaking the data. But then this is happening right now and now you're asking it to be more. So what, what are these demands translating into? The hate, it should have its own opinion. It should be able to recognize there was this systematic racism thing, and then this happened, and then that happened, and based on that, it was turning into something else, and then we need this thing, and that thing, it needs to have its own opinion, it needs to remove itself from the data and look at it more objectively. Well, what are the consequences of that? So, when we're talking about someone who sees the data and can still recognize that it might be wrong, this is what we call an artificial general intelligence. What you're asking for me to create is basically something that has its own conscious, something that can understand, something has a history, something has feelings of its own, something can recognize that, okay, this person is innocent, despite of what the data says. But then, here's, here's the catch here. It's not a tool anymore. It's taking data, it's formulating it, it gives its opinion, but take them, as a pinch of salt, your, your own opinions are way more, let's say, objective than the AI's opinion. So yeah, that was my brief sort of uh, presentation for today. We went through the recap, we went through the whole cycle of how we are making our institutions safe. 
into what an AI is, how can it affect that, why would it affect that, and what is the best way to deal with it. There is going to be vulnerability, there's going to be threats, but there are ways to deal with it.